Hello, welcome once again to Leto's Law. I'm Steve Leto. Today we're talking about my army truck. I do not have it anymore, but I had an M35A2 deuce and a half for a couple of years, and I've mentioned it from time to time here. And people have said, Steve, why don't you do a video about your deuce and a half? And I've always felt silly doing a video when I don't have actual video to show you. And as I was thinking about this, I was reminded that a good friend of mine named Mark Clemens, who lives in Minnesota, actually came on two trips where I had the deuce and a half with us. So um, he shot some film one year with a small digital camera back when that was a, a, a big deal. And I'd forgotten that he'd done that. And so I found the disc that I had with the little films on it and said, hey, Mark, is it okay if I use those? My, my, my audience and my channel are clamoring to see the deuce and a half rolling down the road. And he said, absolutely go right ahead. So thank you, Mark Clemens. So he'll be in some of these shots as, you know, he's the cameraman. That's what happens is the cameraman often winds up in the shots. But in case you're curious, for those of you who don't know, M35 Deuce and a Half is a, um, uh, it's an army truck. It's a big army truck. It's a big pickup truck. And they often use them as troop carriers. Mine was configured as a troop carrier, which means that it actually had fold-down racks in the back. There were benches that you could sit on. And I forgot how many troops it could carry, but they call it a two and a half ton truck because it has a two and a half ton payload capacity off-road. On road, it's ranked or rated at five ton capacity. That's just simply how the Army does its nomenclature. But I am looking right now at some documents and some data I got off the internet regarding the M35A2, and this sounds about right. But um, it's roughly uh, 112 inches tall. It's uh, 96 inches wide and 277 inches long and weighs roughly 13,000 pounds empty. Now, here's the deal. Um, I can tell you that I got mine and I plated it at a civil, as a civilian truck. And I actually just walked into the Secretary of State's office and said, I've got a pickup truck. And she looked at the title and the truck title just simply said, you know, AM General Pickup Truck and had a weight on it. And the weight was below 13,500 pounds, which I believe is the cutoff, at least it was at the time. And no flinching, just looked at it and said, oh, there you go. Boom, filled the information, handed me a plate. So my truck had a civilian plate on it. Now, it was built in 1969. I probably could have gotten a historic plate for it. But the problem in my mind was I was going to be driving it a lot of places, obviously not in parades or car shows. I didn't even want to go there. So I simply plated it as a civilian vehicle. Um, now, mine had a winch on the front. Not all of them have winches, but the winch does add a little bit of length to the vehicle. Uh, and also, uh, the standard wheelbase cargo bed is 8 feet wide by 12 feet long. And that's one of the things that makes the truck so big is the cargo bed is gigantic. And I'm here to tell you, I do not have any photographs, I don't think, of the car parked in my garage. I'm going to look. I, I thought I had one, but I don't, I don't have one handy right here. But the car, to fit in my garage, I actually had to empty the garage. I had a three-car garage at the time. And I emptied the garage out, and I'd park it diagonally across two spaces. And literally, if I had someone who could guide me would pull it up so that the bumper goes like this and has the angled sides and the angled sides would go right up to the wall I, I but this far from the wall and that would allow the far right parking space in the garage to still be used so three car garage being taken up by one small car and one gigantic truck so the truck would only fit in the garage if you put the top down my m35 had a cloth top and also you'll notice in some photographs it's got a very very tall smokestack that goes above the uh, window glass, but I actually also had a shorter stack I could put on it, and I'm not sure if I've got any photographs of that. I'll look around and see, but I actually went to the store and got a shorter stack that would go on it simply because it was so much work to just take things on, take things off, and I didn't always want to have to wait and, and wait for that stack to cool before I grabbed it, and, 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 and so that's what I often did, but... Um, like I said, the truck is just huge. It's gigantic. In case you don't know, it's got three axles. All of them can drive. The rear two axles each have dualies on both sides. So the vehicle's got 10 tires on the road, and it's got another full-size spare tucked up behind the driver's side uh, underneath the bed. Um, it's also got the front axle in a way that it can be disengaged. So if you're on the freeway trying to do 55 miles an hour, it's right near the top speed on that thing, uh, you could disengage the front axle and obviously get more, uh, you know, slightly less rolling resistance. Uh, but whenever you're off-road in extremely ugly situations, which I somehow managed to find myself in quite often, 
um, you would engage that front axle and that thing couldn't get stuck anywhere. And if it did, it had a winch. So as long as there's something nearby you could anchor it to, you were getting out of there. Um, the M35A2 is available with a canvas soft top or a metal hard top. I had the canvas soft top, which you could take down kind of like a Jeep. Uh, took a little more work because the military is not as into making things consumer grade the way that Jeep is. Um, and uh, metal hardtop configurations are most often found in vehicles that have been equipped with cold weather gear, including additional insulation in the cab as well as engine coolant or multi-fuel fired cab personnel heaters. Mine did not have a heater, did not have a defroster, did not have any of that nonsense. <laughs> there were times I wished it did, but it didn't. And the windshield wipers barely did anything. But uh, yeah, I mean, I remember going out in cold weather, bundled up inside that thing, you know. And I mean, I've talked to guys who were in the military riding in the backs of these things in the desert. So they, they'll go anywhere. Uh, they might not be comfortable, but they'll go anywhere. You'll notice in some pictures in mine, I actually have a diamond plate box in the back that I mounted to the bed and that locked. Because without that, these things don't have locks on them. Anybody can walk up, just open the door. If they know how to flip all the switches, they can just start the thing up and drive off with it. So I also couldn't lock things inside of it for that very reason. So I actually had a diamond plate box in the back that was locked. And that's where I put all my tools and equipment and my jack and anything valuable I was traveling with got locked up in the back. Cool thing is also this thing has air brakes. So there's a big tank uh, underneath the bed in the back, kind of near the spare tire. And when you fire this thing up, there's one of the gauges on the dashboard that will actually start showing you how much pressure you have in that tank. And then there's a point at which it says, okay, now it's safe to drive. And so if you're driving around, every time you hit the brakes, you know, you're getting the boost off that uh, compressed air in that tank. And I apologize I'm not describing this perfectly accurately, but I got the gist of it. And so the funny thing is that this vehicle also had a spigot underneath the passenger side dashboard. And the spigot allowed you to plug in an air hose. And you could then, for instance, air up your own tires with it if you had the proper size hose with the right time of attachment. And I did. <laughs> and so on the bike trips, I'd often go, I'd throw my mountain bike in the back, and I'd show up someplace and go, does everybody have air? And some poor fool would pull out a pump, and I'd go, no, no, put that thing away. I got, I got air right here, and I'd pull this thing out, sh -sh -sh -sh, air up everybody's tires, and that was pretty cool. So um, they're, they're, just, they're just a trip. One thing I'll tell you, though, because of the 10 tires and the cloth roof and the diesel stack being right there, these things make a hellacious amount of noise. Driving down the road, you will eventually go numb from the vibration and the noise. And there's a big, bright yellow sticker on the dashboard that goes, Hearing Protection Required. Now, the military put that there, but it's good advice. So you'll often see in photographs that I have of myself driving it, I'm wearing earplugs. Hanging from the rear view mirror in any picture you see that are another set of earplugs. And I actually had a box full of earplugs on the floor of the truck. Anytime anybody got in, I'd offer them earplugs. And I've actually had people say, why? And I said, trust me, you're going to want them. So you, you spend a lot of time driving these things yelling back and forth. So we'll, we'll talk to that you know, in, in a second as well. Um, curb weight of an M35, like I said, 13,000 pounds. And that's empty-ish. Top speed, 56 miles per hour. It has a five-speed transmission. And putting it in fifth and sailing down the freeway, floored right around 55, 56 miles an hour. Um, and like I said, I, I did that many times. Drove it from uh, down in the Detroit area up to Copper Harbor and back twice. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> I know a lot about the high-speed runs as well. Um, talks about fuel economy. It says 11 miles per gallon. Highway 8 City, it had a gigantic tank, and it was multi-fuel, meaning that you could run it on diesel or a variety of other things. The problem is that many of those other things aren't sold at gas stations uh, in uh, civilian life. But if you're at the front in a war, uh, and it was important, you could pour almost anything in there that would burn and probably drive out of there. Uh, the drivetrain that's described to you is, again, more generic. M35A2 is commonly powered by an LDT 465 cubic inch engine. Mine was made by Continental, but some are made by Hercules or White. Here's the cool stuff. An inline six-cylinder 478 cubic inch engine. Um, now, mine was not turbocharged. 
Okay, some of them were turbocharged, some of them were not. I actually asked around, did some research, and I had guys tell me, dude, don't, don't get the turbocharger. It adds a level of complication. So I didn't do it. Five-speed manual transmission. Uh, Two-speed transfer case, by the way, just in case. Just in case. Trust me. Put this thing in creeper low. Put it in low range in the transfer case. Engage the front axle, and that thing would pull buildings off their foundations and wouldn't even hesitate. Um... Multi-fuel engines are designed to operate reliably on a wide variety of fuels, including diesel fuel, jet fuel, kerosene, heating oil, or gasoline. But they don't recommend gasoline in an emerg- except in an emergency because of injector pump problems. Um, and then um, there are four different iterations of the A2. Uh, so I'm not going to get into those either because I don't know much about them. And so um, all I can tell you right now is that um, I had the A35 A2 with a civilian plate on it, drove it up north many times, and now we're going to check out some film of this. So, for instance, um, when I brought it up north, I drove it all the way up north. And once I got there, I would tell my brother Ken, who, by the way, before he worked at Ford Motor Company, he worked at AM General. And I said, Ken, you can drive it. Notice I got a GPS attached to the windshield. I did that on purpose. The speedometer in my vehicle, hey Mark, how you doing this, Mark? The speedometer in my, in my truck's dashboard actually had a little bit of a wobble to it, which led me to believe that the cable going to the dashboard was probably kinked. I never bothered to get, get a look at that. And instead, I just thought, well, it's more accurate to have the GPS unit. So I would often just measure my speed off the GPS unit. Um, so the cab in my vehicle, I'd replaced the seats. And there's my brother Dave. Hey, Dave, how you doing? And, and so what we'd do on these trips is there'd be two adults in the front driving along. It'd be Mark and Ken. And Dave and I and our friend Tom would pile in the back. And we'd drive around old logging roads looking for stuff to run over or looking for stuff to look at. So uh, here we are driving along down an old logging road, someplace up near the tip of the Cunha Peninsula. That's me there, yakking away in the corner, drinking Diet Coke. That's Tom Hawkinson sitting on the ground there. And there's Mark, the cameraman. Like I said, the cameraman always gets in the shot. And there's my brother Dave um, doing what he does best. <laughs> and I'll leave that to you guys to figure out what that is. So um, these, these videos, like I said, are very short. And I apologize for that. But like I said, Mark shot these a long, long time ago on a very, very small uh, uh, camera with a very, very small memory, I think. And here we we're discussing moving it around out at the Clark Mine. And the Clark Mine has been abandoned for many, many, many years. Uh, there's a smokestack still there. I'll show you a photograph of it. But we're worried here because there are cave-ins. And I'm concerned that my 13,500-pound paperweight might go through. So Ken's driving. We're back there pointing and yelling. And we're trying to explain uh, to each other and these strangers why we're being so worrisome about where we drive the truck. And Ken's about to back the truck out of there. And like I said, the primary concern we have is uh, I don't want to see that thing fall on the ground. Although we could probably winch our way out. <laughs> you notice it kicked out a little bit of smoke there on, on startup. What can I tell you? It's a military service. I believe that's the second engine in that truck. There was a rebuild plate uh, someplace on the cab that indicated that the engine and other major portions of the truck had been rebuilt during the time. Uh, that it was in the service, and the mileage I think was around thirty or forty thousand miles. I forgot what the standards were, but there is a point at which they would actually take an M35 out of service, whether it needed it or not, and uh, upgrade the engine and replace some other basic maintenance stuff, and then put it back in use. But it also had a Hobbs meter, an hour meter, and so while you know you always think about mileage on vehicles. A lot of work of vehicles have actually got something that records engine hours. And that's one of the things that you look at on a vehicle like this is not just how many uh, miles it's driven down the road, but how many hours the engine's been running. So um, here we are again. Now Mark is in the back with us. The diamond plate box is underneath the canvas there. And Dave and Tom are leaning on the cab, which I kept telling you not to do because the cab is simply supported by a very, very small bar. It's not designed to support the weight of two grown men. But then again, I'm yelling that at them. I like to tell people that the interior of the M35A2 was designed by the same people who designed um, Cold War era Russian diesel submarines. Everything was just cast iron and right angles and lasted forever but would hurt if you bumped it the wrong way. Uh, and I apologize for anybody who's insulted by me saying that. Just a shot through the window, maybe. 
of us rolling along. By the way, the four-color camo on this, I rattle canned that. I actually did that using cans of spray paint that were the proper color. But I didn't follow the actual design. If you look it up online, you can find a pattern, and they'll actually tell you what pattern to use. And I didn't actually follow the pattern. I didn't have that kind of time. But I rattle canned it in such a way that it actually looked pretty good. I'd rattle canned it, but the funny thing I got to tell you is that I was driving up north one of the times I drove up to the Upper Peninsula, and the Michigan National Guard often does things on the weekends up and down I-75. And on one occasion, I'm driving along, and all of a sudden I see a convoy of M35s ahead of me. And they're driving slower because it's a convoy, so I pass them. And these guys are, first they think, hey, someone's out of order, and all of a sudden they realize, no, it's a civilian in an M35. These guys are waving and honking, it's, 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 it's a party. And so I stopped at a rest area to let my eardrums catch up and also just to gather my thoughts. And these guys pulled in. And they all pulled in. And it's funny, as I was walking over to say hello to them, several of them walked over to say hello to me. And a couple of guys go, dude, where'd you get the truck? And I said, well, I bought it surplus, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I'm dressed like a civilian, so obviously I'm not in the military. And, and, and well, one guy goes, I knew you were a civilian. He goes, your truck looks so nice. <laughs> so... That was a compliment coming from somebody in the military. Uh, but, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I actually did put it in a couple parades. Uh, I got invited to be in a parade, and so I had a load of Boy Scouts in the back one time up in a small town up in the Thumb of Michigan. Uh, but I had a blast with it, but it got to the point where I wasn't using it as much as I would have liked. So finally I just said, you know something, I, I, I'll, I'll just sell it. And I sold it to a guy who actually put the racks back in, got the cover for the back, and he brings it up in parades. And he actually put the numbers in the bumper to make it look like it was an actual you know, veteran, which I, I, I admire that. I admire that. But the last thing I have to tell you is a photograph I'm going to put on the screen at the last moment. And this is a photograph that Mark sent me after he shot the video. He said, by the way, Steve, just to let you know, your truck is visible from space. <laughs> There's a photograph taken from a satellite. And that is my truck in the driveway by the yellow arrow. And the shiny thing you're seeing there is the diamond plate bot box in the back. So I hope you enjoyed it. That's my M35A2. I don't have it anymore. I miss it, but I really couldn't have given it the attention it deserved. I might get another one someday, though. I might. So we'll see. Questions or comments, put them below. Otherwise, talk to you later. Bye-bye.